you for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about uh, integrating IoT cloud analytics and over there updates uh, with Google and Mentor. Uh, I just wanted to get a feeling about um, how many of you have heard of Internet of Things and IoT. Uh, that's good. Uh, and how many, can it, how many can define IoT in one sentence, what it is? Oh, one person. I don't know if I can make that claim. Uh, but uh, session overview, uh, we are going to talk about uh, overview software updates for IoT uh, with Mender and uh, how we, we did a reference integration with uh, Google IoT Core and uh, this is a presentation on um, what this reference integration, what we did and uh, what problems we tried to solve by doing this. Uh, and I'll also at the end share, there's a very detailed tutorial on how we did this on uh, the Google Cloud community uh, so you can do further reading and in more detail. So about me quickly, my name is Mirsa. Uh, I'm primarily titled as an embedded Linux developer. I've been working with this in, uh, for the last uh, eight years. Primarily development in uh, U-Boot, the Linux kernel. The last few years I've been working a lot with the Yocto and build root and like build systems and more integration work and then the development. And I come from a company or from a project called Mendor.io, uh, which is an open source update solution for embedded Linux devices. And an open source Apache licensed uh, and supports a different vari variation of update styles. Uh, and I will talk a bit, a bit more about it. Uh, and I just want to mention uh, the, the Northern Tech is the commercial entity or the company behind the Mendor.io project. So that's why my email says as well, uh, at Northern Tech is an at instead of um, Mendo.io. And just quickly, we are hiring. So take a look if you're interested. So Internet of Things, uh, let's come back to that definition of what it is. Uh, I'm just sourcing Wikipedia and, and trying to explain it. But uh, in short, it means taking all the things in the world and connecting them to the internet, which sounds both exciting and frightening at the same time. Uh, and this is something that, I mean, we are trying to address, but security and, I mean, the most thing that were connected to the internet earlier has been uh, servers or enterprise grade, uh, server parks, data centers, uh, and it's fairly well known, the security practices and there's certifications and so on, on how to do this. But now any, anyone can buy a Raspberry Pi and connect it to the internet and this creates uh, a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of problems, and which are interesting to solve uh, technically, of course. So, I mean, once you connect uh, all the devices in the world to the internet, you need to have some way of updating the software on these devices, because now they are exposed to everything that's out there. So, and, I mean, there will be bugs in your code that you need to fix by doing uh, updates. They will also, over time, become non-vulnerabilities in your system. And this is not something that you can avoid, it's just how things work. People find the exploits and uh, they are well known over time. And if you don't fix them, your devices are very exposed. And this is where we see a lot of this, uh, there's this concept of botnets that is, keeps growing. And that means there is like, uh, yeah. Uh, applications or scripts that are probing the internet for vulnerable devices that are usually they probe devices like known uh, password uh, default logins right and if you haven't changed that they try to inject uh, malware into these devices and then you can use these devices they I mean the Mirage uh, botnet attack took down the west east internet on the west coast like took down the sites like github uh, Reddit and so on. So I mean, you can do a lot of things if you aggregate million devices. You can do a lot of malicious things with it. You also want to, to be able to deploy new features. Obviously, if you deploy your devices into the field, uh, if you have the possibility to deploy features over the air, uh, you can get like faster, faster to the market, and add new features uh, as you grow or later on. Uh, and there are a lot of like scary examples that I mean the Fiat Chrysler recall, or it's very common to recall cars because there's some software bug that needs to be fixed. 
I mean, and with all their updates, that uh, solves a lot of problems for people. And there are some challenges when you are in this IoT space and you are connecting things, and things are normally not something that you have uh, like physical access. It can be installed in a car that's moving. It can be distributed devices over the, the, the country, the world, and so on. So you don't have like the physical access. If something was wrong, you cannot fix it easily. Uh, so you need to have some, um, and that poses some challenges, of course. Uh, I mean, and these things, Internet of Things devices, normally had a long expected lifetime. So you don't want to have maintenance on them. So once you install them somewhere in a remote location, they're expected, expected to live for five to ten years. Uh, and that also brings a lot of new challenges. And uh, another channel uh, unique uh, like for this environment is uh, unreliable power. Uh, which might not always be there. So if, you, if it's in, installed in a car, if you shut down the car, you lose the power to your device, or you need to, be, uh, you need to ha handle these kind of cases as well. And also unreliable, unreliable network, if you are using uh, 3G connections and you have moving vehicles, and you are gonna get uh, intermediate connectivity and low bandwidth and so on. So the, there's a lot of challenges in, in this space. And some of the criteria for deploying over-the-air software updates, I mean, if you have a distributed devices uh, around the globe, uh, you need to have the confidence and the solution that you're using must be robust and secure. That means if something was wrong, uh, there needs to be some fail-safe mechanism so you can recover your devices, so they are not uh, bricked in a sense if something was wrong, so you have to make, like, manually fly there or send the technician to fix that. It should always like go back to a working state if something was wrong. Atomic installations is is really important if you are managing a fleet of thousand or ten thousand of devices. Uh, when you deploy an update, you want to make sure that all of those ten thousand devices got the same software on them right now. So you cannot have a like a, uh, atomic installation means it's either installed in full or not at all. So nothing in between. Uh, which could cause uh, unknown problems because now you have a fleet of 10,000 devices that all have different software, right? So, uh, so an important criteria is automatic installation. Security is a big thing uh, or important thing in, in, in doing this as well. So you have a you need to have some kind of secure transport. If you're trans transferring a payload from a server to a client, it needs to be encrypted. Uh, and you also must be able to cryptographically sign your payloads that you are sending to your devices. So the device can verify this payload is coming from me and not from a third party. Uh, yeah, it should also integrate well with existing development environments, uh, easy to get started. Bandwidth consumption, if you are, a lot of these devices are connected through like 3G or 4G or something less. Uh, and then you have this restriction on the bandwidth, on how much data you can consume. Or, um, and one thing also that's really important is downtime during the update. So if you think about how Android previously does that and did that, uh, that means you get pinged that yeah, there's an update, you want to reboot and install it. And while you are doing this install, your phone is unusable. Uh, and this, and this can be an important use case, uh, depending on the product. If that downtime is acceptable, that while you are doing an update, the device is not functional. Uh, so that's always a take, give or take. And there is this uh, generic IoT update manager workflow, uh, which every solution should have, that we think that it should have. So it should detect an update by using a secure channel. There should be a built-in compatibility check, uh, which means that if you have a different type of devices, uh, it should, there should be a built-in functionality to make sure that the update uh, is targeting a specific device. You cannot deploy a, an update to an un unsupported device and breaking it, basically. Then you have the download, which is also done securely. You need to do integrity checks, so this is checksum. Uh, authentication, that's verifying the signature. Uh, in some cases, you will want to encrypt the payload as well. 
So you have to decrypt it on the device side before you install it. And I have the extraction install steps. Uh, but the last step should always be, I mean, once you deploy an update, there should be some kind of sanity check. Did this work? I mean, does this new software work? And it doesn't just mean that your device starts. It could be additional checks. It does it connect to the internet again, which is quite important if like, if you break internet connectivity, you're not able to update it again. So, I mean, so do you, have, you need to have these sanity checks when you deploy something to your devices. And in case your sanity checks fails, you always should go back to something that is a working state or a non-working state, and which is refer referred to as a rollback. Or, uh, and this is where, like, the men what, what we do at Vendor, we provide a end-to-end -end solution that is open source for managing, trying to tackle these problems that are fairly, I mean, it's, it's, it's common problems for anyone that's using these type of devices, and uh, we are target, targeting specifically uh, Linux devices. And we do, by end-to-end, -end also we mean we provide both, uh, like a, you need a client that you run in the device, but you also provide a management backend and a management dashboard or front end, so where you manage your devices and you create your deployments to your specific devices. So there's no need to glue, glue several projects to just do OTA, it's one solution. Um, and the server can integrate really easily with third-party clients or if you have a separate software that's uh, device management software, you can integrate with the server using the RESTful APIs, which are fully exposed on the server side. And we support different different updating types, so uh, I'm going to come into this uh, on, the, on this page. So Amanda has focused really, uh, from, from the beginning, we've been focusing on something called dual AB system layout updates. And to get this uh, robustness and to be able to roll back to something that is a working state, you basically keep two copies of your operating system. Uh, and in this example, we have uh, OS A and OS B. And OS A is the running system that is currently active. And OS B is inactive, so it's not in use at all. So it's just in or it's waiting. So when you deploy an update, uh, you update OS B or you send a deployment to the OS B in this example. You reboot your device and you switch so that OSB becomes the active one. And if it doesn't work, you can always go back to OSA because that's the like non-working state. And this is a fully atomic and like robust approach. So if whatever happens, it can always go back to the working state uh, or working state. Mm -hmm. And whatever you can also implement like. The criteria for a successful update is different depending on use case or different on depending on product. So it doesn't, it's not just like reboot and if it boots it's a successful. You need to, I mean you need to do implement custom sanity checks that, uh, that the system is still operating. And by default the Mender, the Mender client will actually, the default criteria is that the Mender client is able to connect to the server after an update then it, it's going to mark it as a successful, otherwise it's going to roll back. And there is no, no like downtime in this case, so while you are deploying an update, OSA is still active, so you're just writing the update to always be the inactive system. So the system is fully functional during the update, and the only thing that's necessary to activate this new system is to reboot the system. Uh, so depending on how long the reboot takes, that's the, your time, downtime of your functionality. Yeah. And this is not something that we have invented. I mean, this is fairly standard in, in, in this world, and this is how uh, Android is doing it nowadays, or with the new Android releases, uh, they are also do, or, and in Chrome OS as well. This is how they have been doing it for a very long time. So it's not something like uh, we invented, it's just like standard practice. And if you want fully robust system, or you need to have redundancy, basically. <coughs> And just quickly to cover the Mendo server, um, all the green parts here are developed uh, by us, and it's all open source, which is the nice thing as well. Uh, but I'm not going to go too much into detail. Uh, it consists of a lot of microservices that are connected with each other. Uh, there is a Mongo data database where we store it like the persistent uh, information. Every, all the functionality of the server are exposed uh, 
to RESTful APIs, you can manage devices or manage the server or create deployments using the APIs, but there's also a dashboard or front end where you can do it. And you typically, when you scale up and you have maybe 10,000 or 100,000 devices, then you try to, then you probably are going to move to like using the APIs instead of uh, the front end. And on the server, there's only two ports that are open, and instead, I think this, yeah, it's wrong port. It's 443, yeah, for the HTTPS port. <laughs> uh, so it's, like, it's using TLS communication, so you need to have uh, the HTTPS port open. And port 9000 is used to uh, download the image from uh, the client. And there are no ports open on the, cl on the client side, because the client periodically called the server. Uh, so there's no like bidirectional communication, uh, and it's also a security measure to not keep open ports on the device or require that. Yeah, and I just want to men mention something uh, that's called in this uh, Google IoT integration. We've used something that they called the Octo Project, which is a, which is a tool to create custom Linux distributions. And this is uh, the primary integration point as well for Mender. So if you are using uh, this in your product, it's fairly easy to integrate Mender uh, into an existing solution. And in, the, in this reference uh, implementation that we did with Google, we used Yocto, and there's different layers. MetaMender is our standard uh, meta layer for integrating with Mender. There's an additional layer provided by, by Google, uh, which is uh, GCP IoT, uh, and this adds additional uh, applications that connect to Google IoT Core, which I will explain a bit later. So Google IoT Core uh, is a fully, fully managed service that allows you to easily uh, and securely connect, manage and ingest the data from uh, a lot of connected devices. Supports two protocols, and it's MQTT and HTTP protocols. Uh, and some of the benefits, it scales like it doesn't matter how many devices you have; it should like scale automatically. Uh, and it's managed by Google and that follow industry standard security protocols to protect your data and so on. Um, and this is a, like a reference implementation of uh, what you how you could structure it uh, using the Google IoT core. So here we have. Is it, is it, yeah. So this is the device uh, that's collecting data from sensors or uh, uh, yeah, from a building or something. Some information is collecting some real-world information. Uh, and this edge device is feeding the, IO, the cloud IoT core with this data. And then you can connect different functions to this data, data to store it in a database and uh, so there's this different like workflows uh, that you can apply to this data. And then at the end, you are interested in analyzing the data or produce reports or insights uh, that these devices have generated. You can uh, attach uh, insights tools uh, to, these, um, to the database, basically. And what in more depth, like IoT Core in itself, it's a protocol bridge, so it's connecting, or the devices are communicating with IoT Core using MQTT, uh, and it's the MQTT endpoint for it. But it's also a device manager, uh, so you add devices, you authenticate devices, uh, uh, so that they are able to communicate, so you need to manage devices <coughs> as well. And uh, I mean, connecting devices to something, and there needs to be some kind of a authentication workflow, right? Because uh, just because a device connects to a server, it's not immediately authorized to feed with data or maybe request data. Uh, someone needs to verify that this is a trusted device, this is something that I have produced uh, that's connecting to my uh, interface. And this is fairly complex, or it can become very complex, and this is also, uh, if you're using multiple services, maybe multiple services have uh, their own implementation of how this authorization workflow works. 
So you need to have maybe multiple keys or multiple uh, implementations or workflows to authorize one device in multiple locations. Uh, just a quick overview on how like the, the device authentication in Google IoT code works. And it's based on a, like, uh, a key pair, uh, you store the private key on your device. Uh, and it's going to publish the public key together with the device identity to the Google IoT device manager. Uh, and someone needs to accept that identity um, and ensure that this, this device is trusted. And this is just an example. There are multiple ways of how you can do, do this, uh, but uh, this is one way of doing it. Uh, and this is a more detailed uh, explanation. So you who joined the previous session in this room, uh, there was a talk about uh, JSON Web Tokens, and it's used in this case as well. So you know, if you're expert in uh, JSON Web Tokens. Um, yeah, but this just explains how, how the uh, communication or authentication workflow uh, becomes, uh, can become, or what it looks like. Uh, but then we go to Mender, uh, which is also on a server, and there's also authentication workflow, uh, which is quite similar to how Google IoT Core works, but we have also workflows, and now we have two workflows, uh, and you need to have, um, you need to authenticate a device in two locations instead of one. Uh, but it's similar, I mean, in Mender we also use a unique, uh, Client key pair, uh, you have a private key on your device, and, and then you uh, have a device identity and the device identity together with the public key or the identity of, of the device. Uh, and uh, the devices need to be accepted uh, on the server side. And what we did in this uh, reference uh, integration that we did with the Google IoT Core is to uh, simplify this authentication workflow so that you don't have to authenticate a device in two locations, but you can just do it in one. And in, they are interconnected so that uh, the information is shared between two uh, services. And the workflow in this, uh, in the integration that we did uh, explained here. So first you create uh, a device in Cloud IoT Core, but uh, the identity and the key extracted from the, the vendor client or the, the key that you have on your device basically. Uh, and so instead of manually um, have to authorize it in two locations, uh, there is up to, thanks to these RESTful APIs, uh, you can integrate the Google IoT Core uh, to call the member APIs to authenticate a device based on the information that's already in IoT Core. So it's uh, once you register a device on IoT Core, it's automatically added to the member uh, server as well. And the workflow in this reference implementation is that I mean you use the Google IoT Core to collect telemetry and data to send. Uh, to IoT Core, uh, you analyze, uh, but with this user data, you can also you, you can utilize this to deploy uh, new features to your device, or if you find problems, you can fix them also with uh, using Mender. And yeah, once you have analyzed the data, you can robustly deploy updates uh, based on the analysis that you've done on, on, on the data. <coughs> so what we would, the end result is that you have uh, only one key pair instead of two, so you have two services that you are using but are sharing the authentication. Uh, and on the device you have an MQTT client that uh, talks to the Google IoT Core. Uh, and you have a vendor agent or the vendor client uh, that talks to the vendor OTA server. Um, and you have this um, yeah, different channels of where information flow goes. We have the telemetry and data plane. Uh, and then you have on this side uh, over there updates and uh, firmware management.
And the actual link to this reference integration is there's a very detailed step-by-step -step tutorial on how this is what was done, or you can actually do it yourself uh, if you set up a IoT Core instance. Uh, you connect. You can you, in the tutorial also go through how to set up uh, the Mender server running on Google IoT Cloud as well. So you'll have a habit like all integrated into one uh, place. Uh, and I think that's that's me. That was fast. Uh, questions. <laughs> Who was first? <laughs> I start from the back. Are you aware of what the IETF is doing with the suit working group? And are you guys participating in that? Mm, not participating, um, not fully, I don't have full insight in what they are doing. Okay. What, are you, what are they doing? Mm? Sorry? What are they doing? So they're, they're doing kind of designing a, a firmware update for constraint devices, kind of workflow with very similar. Okay, that, okay, for constraint. Yeah, our focus has been mostly on uh, embedded Linux devices, so it requires a bit more uh, power, or it's easier. We have uh, started exploring uh, more constraint devices as well. Uh, and the problem currently, I guess, is the fragmentation of, there's so many <laughs> real-time system operating systems, and I guess that's, but they are trying to address in that foundation as well to create a standard that you can integrate with. And, uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned the um, AB partitioning, um, which you obviously use, um, which makes sense. Um, you also mentioned that you can update containers. So how does this um, apply here. So let's imagine you would like to update just a container or just one component. Do I get a new partition? No. In that case, if you are, if you want to deploy applications or content containers, then you are just working with the active partition uh, at all times, uh, and you always have the full image as a fallback. So in case of something went wrong with the container or uh, application update then you just deploy a full image and then it's going to be deployed to the OSB in this example. Uh, another question. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so let's imagine you update um, just one component within one of the partitions. What happens if you then do a full um, update? Um, what happens with the old apps? Um, do you move them over? Do you um, um, and figure out if they can be run or that, do you just delete them, fetch new ones? Yeah. So uh, I realize there's one one blob missing here, uh, where we typically have you have a data partition or where you store like persistent uh, information, and this is information that you want to keep across updates or image updates, because when you do, do this uh, AB system, uh, your operating system is basically stateless in the like root file system. Uh, but then you keep a separate partition where you maybe keep uh, data that you have across uh, shared between updates. Any more questions? So having two root files is uh, uh, obviously the way to go, but how do you protect the bootloader? Yeah, that's... And we get that question from time to time, and uh, the bootloader is very application-specific, core project-specific, I would say, and that's not something that we can cover or create uh, like a generic solution for. So it's mostly handled case by case uh, when the company integrates Mender or how they. Uh, I mean, because the norm, the typical problem with the bootloader is you cannot update it unless you have some kind of redundancy uh, and this you typically need to solve using hardware unless your uh, boot code in the processor supports some kind of redundancy. Um, so it's very application specific. And, uh, the Anyone else? Ah, in the front. Hi, thank you for a very uh, good and interesting talk. 
Um, you mentioned uh, Google Cloud Services. Do you have integration with any other cloud services? Not as a, in the same fashion, uh, not yet at least. Uh, I mean, I mean we, we run Mender on AWS, so, uh, but uh, it's possible for this specific integration is only Google Ad. Okay, thanks. And now I will turn around before asking. <laughs> Any more questions? Otherwise, I suppose we give it to you. Was there one more? Yeah. Um, it was interesting talk. Uh, thank you. Can I uh, ask about uh, sanity testing or smoke testing that is done before to verify that uh, it was right slightly actually, I think, that this precision OSB is verified and could be run. Mm -hmm. Uh, how um, how many tests do you have? Uh, because it is saying that it is one minute. Uh, the downtime. The downtime, yeah. but it it is, should include this uh, sanity testing. Yeah. So I mean, we do not actually provide any sanity test. Or the default sanity test is that the Mender client is able to connect to Mender server. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we do provide uh, ways of extending this, mm -hmm. so that because it's also very application specific. What you want to test uh, is your process or application running. Is it connecting to this service and so on? Uh, so we provide ways of extending the custom sanity checks. You can okay. implement your own. Uh, but now it's about two or three test cases. Uh, it depends from yeah. ap application. But, but it is possible to um, expand them? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds. <laughs> Thank you. Any more hands? Otherwise, I propose we give big hands to, to Meza.